it, my talk is really sort of uh, targeting people. I'm, I'm not so much talking to clinicians and physicians as much as I'm, I'm making this talk toward patients and their families. And the purpose of this talk, and you heard from Dr. Hines earlier, is to give you an idea, how can we make the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer earlier? And my goal in life when, uh, as a gastroenterologist was to say, how early can we diagnose this disease and can we catch it even before the cancer forms itself? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And specifically, some families have a predisposition, a genetic predisposition to pancreatic cancer. So I'm going to talk about that and how you can figure out if your family's one of them. So it turns out that if you take any patient with pancreatic cancer and you ask them if there's somebody else in the family with the disease, it turns about 10% of the time that someone else in the family will have a positive history of pancreatic cancer. So about 10% of patients with pancreatic cancer have a positive family history. And in the world of genetics, we build a little family tree which um, it helps us take a look at what the family looks like. And in the family tree, the squares are to men, no surprise there. The circle are to women. And here is a man and a woman. They're married, and they had three children, two, two boys and a girl. And in this family, I made the people that have pancreatic cancer yellow, because sometimes they turn yellow. And here you see the mama and her son had pancreatic cancer. So when you see a family like this, we're worried because two family members in a family with pancreatic cancer is just the statistical chance of that is really, really unlikely, very unlikely. So it makes me think when I see a family like this, something's wrong here. Something's wrong. These people, you shouldn't have so many people with pancreatic cancer in one family. So we've begun to study this kind of problem over the years, and there's a registry of families that get pancreatic cancer at Johns Hopkins, and they studied 362 families, and they wanted to know if you, you personally have pancreatic cancer, what is the risk of somebody else in your direct family getting pancreatic cancer? And what is that risk if only one family member has pancreatic cancer? And what is that risk if more than one family member, two or more people, have pancreatic cancer? So if you have one family member with pancreatic cancer and you're a first degree relative, your personal lifetime risk is less than 1%. So that is very low. So you are very unlikely to get pancreatic cancer if you, like your father or your sister, has pancreatic cancer. Very unlikely. If, however, there are two or more family members with pancreatic cancer, your personal lifetime risk actually goes up to 4%. That's your personal lifetime risk. Okay, so we're going to come back to that 4% in just a minute. But it turns out that families that get pancreatic cancer often get other kinds of cancer too. And so we should be on alert for that because I don't want to save you from pancreatic cancer and then you die on me from colon cancer. I don't, I don't feel good about that. Now, if you died of heart disease, I'd be okay with that or in a car accident, I'm good with that too. But I just don't want you to die in any of the cancers that I'm in charge of. So if one family member has pancreatic cancer in your family, then your lifetime risk as a first degree relative would be 12% of having some other kind of cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. If there are two or more family members, your lifetime risk of getting some other kind of cancer is 27%, so it's very high. So we need to be on the alert to be thinking, I don't want to just save you pancreas cancer, I want to save you from all the cancers. Okay, and the most common cancers that these people get would be breast, colon, and lung cancer. Now let's go back to this 4% here that we were just talking about, the 4% if there are two or more family members who have pancreatic cancer. So let's break down that 4%. So let's say you come from a family that has two or more family members. Let's say your grandmother and your father. And then we say, is your personal risk 4%? Well, that depends. It depends on what is the gene, what is the gene that's causing the disease in your family. And it turns out that there can be a variety of different genes that make you susceptible to pancreatic cancer. 
and I'm going to talk about those in a minute. So in part, your personal risk, your personal individual risk, will be dependent upon the gene causing the disease in your family. It's important to remember that just because you have a gene that may be mutated that makes you susceptible to pancreatic cancer, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the disease. So don't go out and shoot yourself because you're worried you're going to get pancreatic cancer just because you carry a gene mutation because there are plenty of people that carry a gene mutation and yet they don't get the disease. And so this concept of who gets the disease, whether they carry a gene mutation or not, is called penetrance. And I'm going to talk about that right now. So penetrance is the concept that just because you have a gene mutation, will you really get the disease? So we say if you have low penetrance, that means you probably will not get the disease, even though you carry a gene mutation. And if you have high penetrance, it means you probably will get the disease. And the penetrance of the disease is going to depend in part upon what the gene is that you inherited that's mutated, in part. Okay. And next. And there you go. So some families inherit only pancreatic cancer. So when you look at their family history, uh, they just have pancreatic cancer and no other cancers. And some families inherit other cancers as well. And if I can think about what those other cancers are, I can try and figure out what the gene is that might be causing you to be susceptible in your family. So the spectrum of cancers, breast, so you can see pancreatic cancer with breast cancer. Often the breast cancer will happen at an early age of, of, of disease. It'll happen at age 50 or less. Lung cancer, colon cancer, we talked about those. But also stomach cancer and bone cancer prostate cancer. So when you look at families that get pancreatic cancer, these can be some of the cancers that come up in other family members or even the patient themselves. They might have had breast cancer and later they get pancreatic cancer, also ovarian cancer. So I'm just going to mention some of the syndromes that are associated with pancreatic cancer that people can have. So these are colon cancer syndromes. One's called Lynch syndrome, and one's called familial adenomatous polyposis. So these people have a risk of colon cancer, stomach cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Pooch Jagger is a rare disease. These people get polyps in their intestines, but they have an extremely high likelihood of getting pancreatic cancer, also extremely high likelihood of getting breast cancer. Look, here's the breast cancer genes. Who knew? that the breast cancer genes also put you at risk for pancreatic cancer. And it turns out that if you are a male, you're just as likely to get pancreatic cancer as you are to get breast cancer if you carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So I always think about these patients. Now, their lifetime risk is only 5%. And I'm going to talk about what is your lifetime risk, and how do we manage your lifetime risk? I'm going to talk about how we do that, because we don't want to leave people hanging out there who are at very high risk of getting pancreatic cancer and just ignore them. We're against that. That's against our principles. But we have to think about what is your personal risk, and is it enough that we should do something about it? There is a syndrome called FAM where people get melanoma, and pancreatic cancer. Their lifetime risk approaches about 19% for those people. And then diseases of the pancreas where there's chronic inflammation. If you have a lifetime of chronic inflammation caused by cystic fibrosis or hereditary pancreatitis, you also at increased risk of getting pancreatic cancer. So while I've just described to you these different syndromes you can get, the truth of the matter is that most of familial pancreatic cancer is caused by genes that are yet to be identified. We just don't know what they are. Now, if you have a gene that predisposes you to pancreatic cancer, there are certain factors that can influence the penetrance or the likelihood that you're going to get the disease or not get the disease. So let's talk about what those are. So in my, my laboratory, we did some studies, and we looked at 251 patients and out of 28 families, and we looked at their personal risk of, of how that would be affected by smoking, by diabetes, their gender, male or female, and the number of affected family members. 
And it turns out that all of these are important except for gender. So men and women are just as likely to get the disease, but it turns out your risk goes up if you have smoking, if you have diabetes, and the more family members affected, the more your risk goes up. This is a little graph showing you that smokers are more likely to get the disease, and not only are they more likely to get the disease, but they get it a decade earlier. So this is the age of onset, and this is your risk of pancreatic cancer. And you can see here that these people who smoke get it 10 years before other family members do. So I think about that when someone comes to my clinic and they say, I got two family members with pancreatic cancer, and I ask them, do you smoke? Here's a risk factor we could do something about, but it also makes me think about when should I start surveillance for this person as a smoker? Okay. The other thing we noticed is that we had a lot of dry cleaners in our families that got pancreatic cancer. We had three dry cleaners, and we should have had a half a dry cleaner. So that made me wonder, is it the dry cleaning? Is the dry cleaning exposing them to solvents that could cause pancreatic cancer? And in, in fact, what was interesting was, do these families really inherit pancreatic cancer, or do they inherit the business that gives them pancreatic cancer. So I don't know, this is early data and we don't know for sure, but it's very hard to tell a family, look, you've got to get out of the dry cleaning business because I'm worried about you guys. I mean, someone has to clean our clothes for us, so. All right, so let's talk about surveillance because um, I'm a gastroenterologist and this is my bailiwick. As you heard from Joe Hines, a lot of people don't have an opportunity to have surgery because they get diagnosed late. So how can we diagnose these people at an earlier stage when surgery is an option? Well, first of all, let's talk about why is it hard to diagnose pancreatic cancer? Why is it so hard? And so, first of all, most patients early on have no symptoms. They have no symptoms. Why is that? Well, your pancreas is actually located right next to your spine. Now, who knew that? I guess the surgeons knew that, but everybody else didn't know that. It's right in front of your spine and right behind your stomach. So when we do a physical exam, we cannot feel your pancreas. And it's really hard for the pancreas if there's a little growth in there. Most people don't have any symptoms from that little growth until it starts to expand and move into the nerves, which would give you pain, or into the bile ducts where you turn yellow. I mean, it really has to spread for you to start to have symptoms. So early on, most people have no symptoms. As I mentioned, you cannot feel the pancreas on a physical exam. And while there are these very promising salivary biomarkers, and I'm working on a blood test for pancreatic cancer, right now, today, there's no good blood test. There's no good test to find early cancer and precancer. So how are we going to make this diagnosis? So I'm going to take you guys on a little walk so you'll have a better understanding of, of the pancreas and how does early cancer form. So this is the pancreas right here. I drew a little cartoon. And the pancreas job is, it has two jobs. One is to make the insulin that controls your blood sugar. And its second job is to make the enzymes that help you digest your food. And when you eat, the pancreas takes these little enzymes and it squirts it into your intestines here and then you're able to digest the food you ate. Now, early changes of precancer occur in these little small ducts here. This is the main pancreatic duct right here. It's very large, and that's where the juice flows out from. But it's these little side branches, these little tiny branches on the side, like little tributaries to a river. That's where precancer forms. Now, as a physician, if I'm thinking about, I gotta image this thing, how am I gonna see it? A CT scan can pick up something about the size of a dime or a little bit smaller. These branches are so small, it's like a hair. That's how big these branches are if you were to look at them. So they're tiny. They're, you're just not going to pick it up on a CT scan. So that's not going to work. So pancreatic cancer forms in the small and mid-sized ducts first. So that's where in these families. So that's what I got to think about. So how are we going to do surveillance of high-risk families? Well, first of all, we got to think who's at risk here. So in the, the families that we put under surveillance, they have two or more family members with pancreatic cancer, and one of them needs to be uh, 
a first degree relative. So a first degree relative is a parent, a sibling, or a child. Or if someone gets uh, pancreatic cancer before the age of 50, I am personally worried. That is not right. You know something's wrong. It's like getting breast cancer when you're 25. You just know that's not right. Okay. So we talked about if you have a first degree relative, that's how you buy your way into a surveillance program. And we followed over 75 different patients, over 100 people. Our program's been going on for almost 15 years now. So what are we looking for? Let's talk about the precursors of pancreatic cancer. What is the precancer stage? So the precursor lesion to pancreatic cancer is called PANIN, which is we have this you know, as doctors, the way we really make our money is by using really long words to describe what we're looking at, and that's, that's how you get it. So you guys will, are now going to mini medical school because I'm going to teach you this language, and then you can use it too. So pancreatic intraductal neoplasia, or PANIN, is the precancerous lesion, and it shares all the same features as cancer, but has not yet become invasive. Invasive is when the cells move into the organ and start to spread. They start to spread out and move out of the pancreas into the lymph nodes or into the liver. So invasive is when the little cells move into the organs that uh, it should not be in, move into places it should not be in. Now, I'm going to make you into pathologists now. So this is a normal pancreatic duct here in the left lower corner. That's a normal pancreatic duct. Now I'm going to give you your histology lesson. Every one of those round blue circles is a cell, and the cells are these nuclei, the little center of the cell, are mostly the same size and shape. They're like little children that are behaving. See how they're all sitting down? Nobody's jumping up and running around. Everybody's behaving. They have their bottoms right here on what we call the basement membrane. That's the little area at the bottom of the nuclei. Now next to this is PANIN. This is precancer. And these are like kindergarten children that are misbehaving. See how the nuclei are jumping around? They don't, they're not sitting down with their bottoms on the basement membrane anymore. They're all different sizes and shapes. They're pushing out into, this is called the lumen or the center of the duct. This is an empty space where the pancreatic enzymes go. So see how these, these, these cells are misbehaving. And this is precancer right here. Now I'm going to show you the stage right before cancer. This is called PANIN3, or also carcinoma in situ. Now look at this. Look at this. These cells are running, running around. They're running amok. Not only are they all different sizes and shape, but some of them are pinching off and running around in the middle of the lumen, this area where the pancreatic enzymes are. So this right here. So this is the stage before pancreatic cancer, right here. We are just months away, who knows? We are a time period away from cancer. The day these cells move this way, the day these cells move this way is the day you get cancer. And the day you get cancer, we know your odds of surviving immediately go down. So we're against that. Okay. So let's talk about, we know now what the precursor lesions are of pancreatic cancer. We know what we're aiming for. We have a good idea of who's going to be at increased risk. Let's talk about management of patients who have a positive family history. So you have two or more family members with pancreatic cancer. So this is who is at risk, two or more family members with pancreatic cancer, one of whom is a first degree relative to you. Now, you might say to me, why don't we just take everybody's pancreas out? Let's just get that out of there. It's making me nervous. I'm willy-nilly about the whole thing. Well, the reason we don't, taking a pancreas out when there's, quote unquote, we don't know what's wrong with it or it looks like it's a normal pancreas, is called a prophylactic pancreatectomy. And they do this for breast cancer. People who are BRCA1 and 2, they take their breasts off but you know, you don't need your breasts. I mean, I know that men are dismayed to hear that, but women don't really need their breasts, and you do need your pancreas. We talked about it. You gotta have that insulin to control your blood sugar. You know, The enzymes help you digest your food. So we don't wanna take that pancreas out before it's ready. So the key thing here is not every gene carrier, not everybody who has a mutated gene is gonna get cancer, 
there is what we call morbidity, which is sickness, or mortality, which is being dead. There is mor morbidity and mortality with getting your pancreas out. And not only that, but decades could happen before, if you were a gene carrier, decades could occur before you ever got cancer. So we don't want to pull your pancreas before it's time, so to speak. So our task at hand is to identify patients after they started down what we call the neoplastic pathway. That means they've started to get precancer. So we want to identify them after they've started to get precancer, but before the precancer becomes invasive. So that's our goal. All right. Now, when I see families, I always ask them, um, you're a person who got pancreatic cancer in the family. How did they present? Did they get diabetes? Did they have other symptoms? How long were these symptoms going on? And what were the ages that the pancreatic cancer developed in the family? And the ages is particularly important because I need to start their surveillance before the age at which people get pancreatic cancer in the family. Usually, we start 10 years before the earliest age of cancer onset in the family. So if your mother got it at age 60, I would start your surveillance at age 50. Now, I'm a gastroenterologist, and it turns out this endoscopic ultrasound, which Dr. Hines was talking to you about, this is a flexible tube with a TV camera on it and a little uh, ultrasound probe. And we make the patient sleepy, and we help them swallow this flexible tube, and it goes down into the stomach. And remember, the stomach sits right on top of the pancreas. We blow up that ultrasound probe, and we get a beautiful view of the pancreas. And that tells me, is there something wrong with the pancreas? This is a yes or no question. It doesn't tell me whether you have precancer. It just tells me, is there something wrong, yes or no? Now, this surveillance, endoscopic ultrasound, is very operator dependent. So it needs to be done at centers that have a lot of experience looking for precancer. And happily, UCLA has a center here that does do surveillance. It was run by a guy, James Farrell. Now, he just left last week, but I understand there's two people that are filling in his very large shoes. And we have a program up in Seattle. So you want to be, if you're going to have this done, it should be done at centers that have experience doing it. And we have some follow-up tests we can do if we're worried about your pancreas. All right, so this is an endoscopic ultrasound. And you could see here, this just looks like a big snowstorm. So you don't want just anybody reading your snowstorm. You want to have somebody reading this that can tell you, you know, this snowstorm, something's wrong with this snowstorm, okay? So if it turns out the endoscopic ultrasound is abnormal, and then we do a follow-up test, it's called an ERCP, that helps, we put contrast in the pancreatic ducts, and we look to make sure if they're nice and smooth and normal or if they're irregular and lumpy looking. If those are both abnormal, we talk about getting a piece of the pancreas. The only way I know if you have pancreatic precancer, the only way I know is if I take a piece of tissue and I look under the microscope. So what these tests tell me is that it's abnormal, go get a piece of tissue. That's what these tests tell me. Now you and I have gone over the histology, so you remember if you, we go in and get a piece of tissue and it looks like this, are you guys worried? Yes. And you're worried because why? It's precancer. And you know why it's precancer? Because it says so at the top of the slide. Okay? So this is precancer. All right. So if somebody has this stage of precancer and they have a family predisposition to getting pancreatic cancer, I worry about this patient. So at this point, we have to discuss with the patient the risk and benefits of removing the pancreas. Removing the pancreas is a very, very big operation, as I mentioned earlier. So we don't want to do it unless we feel that the person really is on the verge of getting pancreatic cancer. And it's not the right answer for everybody. But the problem is that people that get precancer in one part of their pancreas, they get it throughout the entire pancreas. The whole pancreas gets riddled with precancer. So you don't want to just take out a piece of it and leave the rest behind. If you're going to take out the pancreas, usually you need to take the whole thing out. So there's no right or wrong answer of whether somebody with this advanced stage of precancer should have their pancreas out, but we try to work it out with the patient, explaining the risk and benefits of the surgery and talking about what we know about the disease. And we ultimately let the patient decide what is the right answer for them. 
the patient needs to know that if they get their pancreas out, they're going to have diabetes, like we talked about, because that's one of the jobs of the pancreas is to control your blood sugar. So everybody in my uh, surveillance program who is under uh, consideration for having surgery gets extensive diabetes training so they'll know what they're up against. Now, in the beginning when I started doing surveillance, um, insurance companies wouldn't pay for it. Doesn't that just tick you off? And so what we had to do, in order to get insurance companies to pay for stuff, you have to show that it's cost effective, that they're going to save money. And if you can show it's cost effective, then you can have a conversation with them about doing the procedure. So we published a study showing it's cost effective to do surveillance on people that are at high risk for pancreatic cancer. So if you compare doing this surveillance I've described to a mammogram, it's, um, it's cheaper. This is more cost effective. So we, when, when people do a statistical analysis of what's cost effective, we refer to something as costing X amount of money per life year saved. So how many years of life will I save for people who could be affected and how much does it cost? So it's $17,000 per life year saved for surveillance of pancreatic cancer in high-risk families compared to mammography, which is $22,000 per life year saved, pap smear, $250,000 per life year saved, and colorectal cancer screening, which varies from six dollars to $92,000 per life year saved, depending on what test you get. This is a bargain. This is a bargain. Okay. So it's not the cost of the endoscopic ultrasound that is what drives this cost of surveillance. It turns out that it's your personal likelihood of getting pancreatic cancer is what's driving whether this is cost saving or not. Unfortunately, screening is not cost effective after the age of 70. Why is that? Because people after the age of 70 die of competing causes. So they die of like a heart attack or, you know, Skylab falls on them, or, you know, fill in the blank. So, so there's that, that to me is uh, annoying that we have to put that reality in there, but it is an issue to think about. So it turns out that screening is cost effective if your lifetime risk of getting pancreatic cancer is 16% or greater, 16% or greater. So what that means is, do you remember I was talking to you about BRCA1 and 2? So if you carry the BRCA1 and 2 genes, your lifetime risk is 5%. Your lifetime risk is sufficiently low that it is not worth your time and effort to have endoscopic ultrasound, okay? But if you have that familial melanoma syndrome I described, where they get pancreatic cancer and melanoma, your lifetime risk is 16%. Your lifetime risk is sufficiently high. It does behoove you to get surveillance. If you have two or more family members with pancreatic cancer, one of whom is a first-degree relative, your risk is high enough to warrant surveillance, okay? So in summary, and to wrap up, about 10% of patients with pancreatic cancer is due to some kind of genetic susceptibility. Most of familial pancreatic cancer is probably due to genes that are yet to be discovered due to unknown genes at this time. Penetrance, or the idea that just because you're a gene carrier with a mutation, whether you're going to get the disease or not, plays a big role in how we think about the disease. Families that inherit pancreatic cancer can get other cancers, and I see this in my families all the time. So I need to stay on it. I could save you from pancreatic cancer, but if you die of colon cancer, nobody wins. Gene and environmental interactions influence penetrance and age of onset. So if you are a smoker, you need to stop. If you get diabetes, I worry more about you. If you have multiple family members, I worry more about you. The endoscopic surveillance program appears to be promising, but as I mentioned before, it is operator dependent. It needs to be done at centers that have a lot of experience. And so it's necessary for us to come up with alternatives to that so everybody in the United States or everybody in the world, so to speak, has an opportunity to have early detection. 
And so for that reason, we need to develop a blood test or the salivary test that we were talking about earlier. And that's something that my lab and other labs are working on. Screening is cost effective as long as your risk of getting precancer is 16% or greater. We do this surveillance program at the University of Washington with a group of doctors that work together, which include surgeons, pancreatologists, um, GI doctors, diabetologists, nutritionists, and so on. So it's really a group effort. Thank you very much. Thank you.